I'd like to say welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila Daz, and I'm a teacher in the humanities. And thanks for joining us this morning to this, the final talk, and what's already been a great week of exchanges and insights uh, celebrating the humanities and celebrating the 10th annual uh, Humanities Symposium uh, on reconnections. A quick note to you all that we will be taking questions in the uh, chat tab at the bottom of your screen, and I promise we will get to them at the end. Uh, before we begin, I would like to make a few acknowledgements. First, I'd like to thank uh, the symposium coordinator, Lisa Jorgensen, and the um, symposium coordinating committee. Oh, the Q&A tab. Yeah, the Q&A tab at the bottom. Um, I'd like to thank you guys because your hard work and perseverance throughout this year of COVID-19, this strange year, um, in bringing the symposium together has really paid off, so thank you. And um, it's been a year when we've been physically separated from each other, and we've been also separated from the campus of Vanier College, where normally we would be gathering together for such an event. On that note, it is important, I think, to recognize the site of the college called Ganagahaga as part of the Mohawk community is territory that has never been ceded. And I hope that this recognition may serve as a step in building a better and more just relationship with Indigenous peoples. With that in mind, let us turn to the theme of our discussion today, Reconnections, and our invited guest, Payam Akaban. Professor Akaban served as a UN pr prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, as well as Bosnia, Cambodia, Guatemala, Rwanda, Peru, and East Timor. As counsel, he has served before the International Criminal Court for Georgia concerning ethnic cleansing and also for Libya concerning allegations of crimes against humanity during the 2011 revolution. Professor Akavan is also a member of the Permanent Court of Ar Arbitration at The Hague. And we can see him getting to know the people and the situation on the ground, here visiting the CD refugee camp in Iraq and the Rohingya camp in Bangladesh, where he is working on respectively a truth commission and as counsel. In 2017, he gave the CBC Massey Lectures in Search of a Better World, a Human Rights Odyssey. The book that followed of the same title, which you can see here, was the number one best-selling nonfiction book in Canada in 2018. And we are providing the link for you uh, for this book for those of you who haven't read it. Um, I'm sure uh, it would be uh, something you're gonna be wanting to look into after the talk today. Having taught here in McGill, at, in, in Montreal, at McGill as full professor. He is now a senior fellow at Massey College at the University of Toronto. So Payam, it has been a few years since you joined us here at Vanier um, for our last uh, symposium on empathy. And it is uh, my honor to welcome you back here today. Thank you very much, Sheila, for your kind introduction and uh, greetings to all of the dear friends and colleagues in Montreal. Um, I'm honored to be back, but sorry that we cannot be together in person. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're not quite reconnecting as we normally would, um, but uh, we're, we'll do our best uh, in this time. And thank goodness for this, this platform. Um, today, we're going to be discussing what I think uh, we can call your life's work. Um, that is the work of prosecuting crimes against humanity, including that of genocide. And 
when you discuss these kinds of atrocities, wherever they're taking place, these crimes really are uh, among the worst actions that human beings inflict upon one another. They seem to epitomize, in fact, the loss of connection or the destruction of that connection that we have together as part of the human community. So it seems to me that your work has been uh, a continual effort to reforge that human connection and to um, help us build back together uh, a fairer and more just uh, society. So on that note, I'd like to quote from your book um, where you wrote that the problem is not that radical evil is inevitable. The problem is that we don't really care about human suffering until it comes to our shores. And I would like to explore the, these ideas with you today. One, how radical evil is not inevitable, but predictable, and so theoretically can be prevented, but also about the will needed to prevent great atrocities. And I'd like to chart the obstacles that you have seen um, and how we get to care, how we get to connection um, with those who are suffering, and hopefully um, how we can actually enact um, some of the ways, I, I guess, to, to actually come back together in society. So if I could begin with your experience, um, could you describe for us how you first uh, started to feel that care and connection for people in distant places um, and, and how you cared about their fates and their suffering? Thank you, Sheila, for that uh, very thoughtful um, comment and, and question. Uh, I think um, I, I would begin by saying that we have an idea of knowledge uh, which privileges um, the abstract and distant over that which is uh, intimate and felt. We privilege the objective over the subjective. In, in fact, much of our tradition of intellectualism and Western uh, 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 Occidental uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, rationalism um, is suspicious of emotion. And I can understand that if we look at the fact that, well, it depends on which kind of emotions we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, anger and, and prejudice and violence and aggression, it's understandable that we should try and transcend those emotions. But there are also emotions of compassion and, and empathy and uh, uh, feeling the pain of, uh, of others. So uh, I think it's incredibly important that, you know, Vanier College, and I must commend you and your uh, colleague, uh, uh, Lisa Jorgensen, and the others who I met at Vanier College for making empathy uh, uh, part of the education, part of the idea of the knowledge that we need to gain, which brings me to responding to, to your question. Um, my uh, uh, human rights odyssey, if you like, my, my journey uh, uh, towards understanding the absolutely vital importance of dedicating my life for, for struggling for, for justice began with felt experience. It didn't begin because there was some brilliant intellectual theory that I read in a book somewhere. Um, and coming to Canada as a, a nine-year-old child uh, living in exile, fleeing the uh, uh, violent persecution of the uh, Baha'i minority to which I, I belonged in Iran, uh, was you know, the beginning of that journey. And as a nine-year-old, the idea of human rights, persecution, exile, it means nothing. They're, they're just empty words. But uh, uh, words uh, are only imbued with meaning because of the experiences that we associate with them. And when I was 16 years old, uh, being an you know, immigrant teenager, trying to fit in, trying to be cool, uh, those were the days of uh, disco and I committed some heinous fashion crimes. I'm very grateful there was no Facebook in those days to record my very poor choices. 
but I was, you know, like any other teenager trying to fit in. And then I hear that my 16 year old contemporary in the Baha'i community in Iran, a girl by the name of Mona Mahmoud Nejad, had been arrested because she wrote a high school essay um, demanding her human rights. Uh, and she was an incredibly uh, passionate woman uh, and uh, very fearless, but sadly, um, her courage cost her life. And in the summer of 1983, I heard that Mona had, together with several other Baha'i women in the city of Shiraz, been hanged. So it was one of those crossroads, and I'm sure we all have them in our own lives. There is some event which, in a sense, shatters us. It's that moment where we lose our innocence, and we have to choose what we're going to do about it. And of course, uh, it was incredibly painful to uh, uh, hear this uh, devastating news. But at the same time, I had to reconcile that with the empty consumerist culture of North America <laughs> with which I was surrounded. And of course, I was incredibly grateful to be in a land with so much freedom and opportunity. But at the same time, I realized that all of it is completely empty and meaningless if it isn't used to struggle for justice, to uh, uh, try and fight for human betterment. And I would, at the risk of maybe seeming a bit extreme, I would even say that it made me realize that a meaningful death is better than a meaningless life. The worst thing that we can do is to uh, let ourselves drown in a sea of mediocrity. So in a sense, empathy isn't just about uh, a sense of ethics, uh, solidarity, uh, sort of social obligation, and, and all of the other uh, uh, sort of moral narratives we have as to why we should care about the suffering of others. But it's above all about our own self-realization, about our own self-discovery, until we can connect in profound and meaningful ways with others um, we are not able to discover our own essence and, and who we are uh, as human beings. And I would just end by saying that uh, as painful as it has been to deal with survivors of genocide and, and people whose uh, lives have been profoundly shattered, and I know we throw the word trauma around very loosely in North America, I think for the most part, we have no idea what it really means to, to suffer, I mean, on a collective scale out there in that other world that we see on uh, social media once in a while as a passing image or, or, or story. But I must also say that I have understood the astonishing resilience of the human spirit among the survivors of genocide. Uh, and these people are anything but just victim and victims and objects of pity. They are uh, to me, inspiring examples of what human beings are capable of. The fact that people can go through such, uh, 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 you know, uh, indescribable suffering and still go on living and demanding justice and reconstituting their shattered self uh, is a kind of universal lesson for all of us, which transcends uh, uh, our cultural uh, and, and other differences. It, it shows that we can only see the powerful light of the human spirit uh, in times of darkness, in our struggles. And I, I think it's important, obviously, not to go chasing suffering. We shouldn't go and you know, make life unnecessarily miserable. That's not what I'm saying. But we are all going to have moments of darkness in our lives, and we should embrace those as an invitation from the universe to discover the power uh, of our own self. It's really interesting um, what you're saying because I was thinking about myself. Um, I mean, I have, I would say, a problem um, with uh, numeracy uh, in that when people talk about big numbers, 8,000 people, 6 million people, 10 million people um, being killed, it's hard for me to comprehend those numbers. And it's hard to feel um, uh, what I think maybe I should feel uh, for such um, 
gross suffering on, on such a huge scale. And you bring it back to really looking and, and being open to that suffering that is even around us here in, 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 in Canada and Montreal in our personal lives and being more, I guess, more sensitive to what is even closer to home and, and, and responding with feeling and responding also, I guess, with action. You know, it, it, it's famously said that um, a single uh, a death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Uh, and we are not primed to understand things in abstractions, which goes back to what I said earlier about the, the idea we have about knowledge and education. The beginning and end of all education is empathy, is our capacity uh, in a profound way to connect to the greater world around us. Um, and we need to understand that uh, behind every victim, there is a name, there is a mother, a father, a brother, a sister. Um, and that the only thing that separates us having this wonderful conversation as Canadians and people halfway across the world or people down the street from where we live uh, is largely chance. It's just chance, it's random circumstance. Um, and I, I think that's a very powerful and liberating realization um, because we begin to realize that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to use what we've been given um, in ways that are imbued with meaning and, and purpose. And I don't think that dedicating your life to human betterment shouldn't be about, you know, middle class guilt and all the uh, ideas that we have in our, you know, North American bubble. Oh, my God, I feel guilty because I have a comfortable life. And it's not about guilt. It's about compassion. It's about feeling alive. It's a beautiful thing. It's not an ugly thing. It's a beautiful thing to connect with people in a deep and meaningful way. And to look back at the end of your life and to say that um, I lived my life in an authentic and meaningful way. This most foolish self-destructive thing you can do is to live a life trapped inside your own ego, obsessed with uh, validation by others, you know, superficial validation, as opposed to looking in the mirror and saying, this is who I am. This is what I stand for in the deepest sense. And I mention it because I travel to all corners of the world and I see a lot of suffering, but I also see in the, uh, what I call the psychic pandemic in our North American bubble of anxiety, stress and, and depression, a paradox that here we have a society with opportunities and prosperity beyond the imagination of most of the world. But somehow in our consumer culture, we consume more and more, but we're less and less happy. So um, that's why I go back to the theme that when we go beyond paying lip service to politically correct platitudes and, 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 and you know, slacktivism, it's, it's really easy, isn't it, to uh, engage in virtue signaling, you know, just to say, look, I'm so virtuous, I'm so wonderful, I use all the right terminology, and th that's an illusion, I'm afraid to say, it's an illusion. It may be a good step in the right direction, but meaningful engagement um, always entails sacrifice. If you believe in something, you have to pay a price for it. There is no way around that. And we're so primed in our culture of self-indulgence and consumerism to privilege you know pleasure over pain that in a sense we deprive ourselves of the privilege of the privilege of actually struggling and sacrificing and paying a price for something that we uh, believe in uh, and without that journey we will never realize uh, our true potential as human beings so before, before we get to like what has been your journey, I just want to pick up on that, uh, what you just said about North Americans. And um, I think I, I'll include myself in that, in that group. Um, you know, that sometimes we're 
I think, guilty of maybe easy choices um, that will write a quick check to, to some campaign and feel, well, my job is done here, um, or will click a like on some Facebook post and, and feel we've expressed our indignation and, and good for me. And, and then now I can go on with my day. Um, so how do we get beyond uh, what you call this, this slacktivism? How do, we, how do we actually here in North America uh, find a way, concrete ways, I guess, to be more engaged? It's a very difficult question to answer because I think every human being is unique and everyone has a unique story and a unique journey. And there's something wonderful about that. Uh, so I have my story, you have yours, and everyone else has theirs. But I think the, the universal theme here is that we need to want to discover our own authenticity. If, if we are, uh, in a sense, imprisoned in our ego, and, and I use the term imprisonment because so much of our culture is about the ego. It's about... Uh, self-indulgence and narcissism and greed. This is what our sort of materialistic civilization tells us about success, to be rich and famous or, or whatever, uh, uh, you know, uh, feeds the ego. Um, and even when it comes to human rights and social justice, very often we wear it like an accessory, you know? Um, it's chic to be politically correct. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. So we need to go beyond the appearance of things, the illusion, the mirage, and realize that the deeper truth where we discover our own true self, if you like, of our authentic self, um, isn't about images and appearance. It's about really a deep, heartfelt uh, journey in our inner universe. And so much of our culture of utilitarianism and rationalism and technology-fueled progress and endless entertainment and distraction is all about avoiding that journey <laughs> because it's a difficult journey. It, uh, you know, one of the things that was incredible, when I was in Bosnia during the war in the 1990s with the United Nations, um, where you know, you're in the middle of a war zone. People are getting killed all around you. I met people who were there risking their lives because they were actually escaping their own personal wounds and traumas. I had the most remarkable conversation with humanitarian workers in the middle of a war zone who would open up at some point about some childhood experience or some failed marriage or, or what have you. Everyone has their own wounds. And there was something uh, actually incredibly uh, beautiful about the simplicity of the fact that no matter how far we run away, um, we are never going to heal our own wounds until we stop and we have that conversation with our own self. So that's why I'm saying that when you um, choose a particular career or when you choose a particular circle of friends or you choose to behave or relate a certain way with your colleagues at work in your own family or, or what have you, all of it is interconnected. All of it is inextricably interdependent. We tend to compartmentalize, you know, life, work, career, uh, uh, friends at work, family, and it's all part of one single indivisible uh, transaction. So getting back to your question, it's difficult to answer because exactly it can't be reduced to a soundbite. Uh, it requires deep reflection and contemplation. Uh, and the most important truths which have the capacity to completely transform our lives are the most subtle. They're not the obvious uh, things which we can wear or show or utter in one clever soundbite, but it's the profound changes that we make in our own inner self, which then reflect in everything that we do in our lives. Yeah, that makes um, a lot of sense to me. Um, and so we all have to, I think, start working more and start thinking more about um, who we want to be and how we can um, 
how we can live our lives in, in that, let's say, more meaningful way. I want to now go to your life in particular and some of the experiences uh, you have had. And, um, and some of the observations I, I've read uh, that you've made as you've gone on um, that I guess has surprised me a little bit. Um, when you, when you recognize, when you, when you recognize, um, let's say the difficulty that perpetrators have had, perpetrators of war crimes, of mass killings, of other kinds of gross injustices, that these perpetrators themselves um, have difficulty dealing with their own actions. And uh, at some point, I think you, you, you called that a cognitive dissonance, that they want to be a good person, maybe everyone wants to be a good person, and yet they're doing actions that, I suppose, in their heart of hearts, they know doesn't fit with their image of themselves as a, as a good person. And if you could maybe just walk us through um, an example or two of the instances of that um, with some of people that you've met and, and maybe how much work needs to be done to, to erect this cognitive dissonance so that um, people actually can commit these sustained acts um, of, of, of violence. It's a, a very... Uh... Uh, good, but once again, difficult question to to answer. And uh, it's remarkable the the the, the duality of human nature. Uh, we're capable. I've met people who are capable of you know murdering children in cold blood, and I've also met people who would risk their own life to save a random stranger. So what is it? about this duality of human nature and, and how can we bring out our better selves? Um, and I remember once uh, in 1993, I had gone to a village in Bosnia called Ahmici to investigate an uh, atrocity um, where hundreds of innocent civilians had been um, basically dragged out of their homes and uh, executed. Um, and it, it was tragic, you know, to even see a, a mother who was holding her child, both of whom had been uh, killed. Um, so this was, you know, very shocking. I was in my 20s and I had, you know, my own ideas about, oh, I'm going to go and become a human rights lawyer. And I got much more than I bargained for. And I realized it's not romantic at all, you know, to be the Indiana Jones of the human rights world. This is, this is horrible. This is horrifying. How can anyone be capable of this and there there is a, a beyond the moral and emotional response even an intellectual fascination with how can someone justify such an action and one of the things that i realized is that more often than not people who commit evil acts do it in the name of the good and that's the shocking thing the whole idea of ethnic cleansing cleansing is a good thing right so it's almost like we are cleansing ourselves of this other ethnic group which is defiling us when you look at the nazi propaganda which justified the holocaust it was about getting rid of the lice human beings were reduced to lice and rats and vermin so the greatest evils were always committed in the name of the greatest good and more often than not it was the the the, the triumph of radical evil was because good people did nothing, because people were apathetic, people were indifferent. Now, after this village, uh, seeing this village, um, I remember a sniper uh, who tried to kill my colleague and I. So in addition to witnessing these horrors, you feel this um, adrenaline, animal fear, you know, when someone's trying to kill you and the randomness of life and death, you know, a bullet narrowly missed my head, you know, and I could have died, I could have died that day. And you realize what makes me different than all these other people who've been killed. You, you realize how random, how random it is. So I was extremely angry and shocked. And I asked the UN peacekeepers to drive me 
to the office of the general, General Blaskich, his name was. And I, I'd lost my mind. I didn't know what I was doing. So I walked into the office of this general who is sitting there with all of his soldiers. I took off my blue UN hat, put it on the table, and I just looked him straight in the eye. And I just started recounting in gruesome detail everything that I'd seen in that village. Um, family that had been burnt alive in their basement, the mother with the child in her arms. And I just looked him straight in the eye. And I mention it because he could have had me shot right there. You know, I didn't have a weapon, I didn't have anything. He could have just taken me and killed me right there. But he couldn't look at me straight in the eye. And it was a remarkable moment for me. He could not look at me straight in the eye because you know what? He had his own wife and children and family and he could not admit to himself that it was on his orders that these men had committed these evil acts. He'd simply outsourced them so he could somehow distance himself. And what I saw again and again is that perpetrators too are traumatized. Almost everywhere I went before perpetrators would commit acts of rape and torture and murder and all these profound expressions of inhumanity, they had to get drunk, they had to consume drugs. In Rwanda, the people who killed the Tutsi with machetes very often took narcotics and they needed peer support. It was interesting. They needed someone to tell them, it's all right what you're doing. That instinctive sense of suffering that you see is acceptable, it's fine. That woman, that child, that elderly person, they deserve to die. They're cockroaches, they're rats. So the, 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 the point is that you begin to see how uh, fascinating in a sense the human psyche is, what we're capable of justifying to ourselves when we're driven by our ego, uh, by our selfishness, by our sense of uh, fear, uh, ignorance, greed, what have you, all of these base impulses. But you also see sometimes in the most unlikely places, this flash of conscience, this glimpse of conscience mm -hmm. that even ruthless killers, I mean, some people are just, you know, sociopathic, whatever they're, they're, they need, you know, professional, you know, treatment and therapy, but that's not what most of the people were like. Most of them were school teachers, doctors, policemen, the neighbor next door, who in the wrong place at the wrong time found themselves capable of doing things, which they themselves probably never anticipated. And I'll just end by maybe saying one last thing. Um, in my book, I detail how the members of the notorious uh, Nazi uh, extermination squads, the so-called Einsatzgruppen, had regular problems with psychological breakdown in the ranks. And uh, it's extraordinary to think that, imagine, you know, Nazi killers requiring therapeutic treatment because they would go somewhere in the Ukraine in uh, Babi Yar and kill 43,000 Jews. And then they would come back to Berlin and sit around the dinner table at home with their own wife and children. And that is the cognitive dissonance because we are primed as human beings to see others uh, as uh, the same, as being the same, which is why in every instance of injustice, whether it's, I don't know, racism against indigenous people in Canada or against African-Americans in the United States, all the way to genocidal violence halfway across the world, the common denominator is dehumanization. We need to convince ourselves that what we're doing is not wrong, that in fact it is right. And it was famously said that the, the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chambers, it began with words. So I'm not sure if I've answered your, your question, but um, you know these are the, 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 the journeys in the human mind which have made me realize that there is actually hope. There's a lot of hope in the world. And I've, I've maybe one last story I have to share again from Rwanda. Um, my friend Jean-Paul Samputu, great musician, 
during the 1994 genocide, he found out that his next door neighbor's friend, Van Sant, has killed, has killed, had killed his father. And he was consumed by grief and anger and self-destruction and drugs and alcohol and you know, several attempts at suicide until one day he healed. His uh, music career actually uh, became you know, highly successful. And one day he found out where his friend Vincent was. And he went back to the village and he looked at him straight in the eyes and he said, I forgive you. I forgive you. And the people in his village thought he had lost his life, but he said that I forgave him for my own self. <laughs> and what's remarkable is now they have reconnected at an even deeper level, which doesn't excuse what Vincent did. What he did was a crime, but it also shows you that people can heal, people can be transformed, that someone who today is the violent white supremacist can also uh, rethink and become best friends with his African-American neighbor. Uh, and it's too easy to point the finger and judge. Um, and it's much more difficult to try and understand why do people behave in these ways and how can we reach them uh, and try to uh, bring out that sort of higher noble self. You, you make me think um, of a, another men's work I know, David Shantz, who, who went to Rwanda um, after uh, the genocide uh, to work actually with both Tutsi and Hutu groups um, in rebuilding um, some villages, um, rebuilding some of the, the, the structures, houses um, that had been also demolished and that you had a Hutu and Tutsi working side by side. And he said, you know, um, a lot of the, the Hutu who were responsible, they, they couldn't all be jailed. I mean, you had so much of the society participating that the idea of finding justice in just jailing people was not even conceivable and because more than half the society would have been locked up. And so the project he was working on was actually rebuilding the society by rebuilding those connections and that people who were afraid of each other or hurting each other just you know, months ago were actually now working together um, in actually constructing buildings. And the hope there was that their relationships would also be rebuilt um, in the process, like the story you're telling of, of your friend. You know, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, in his famous book on anti-Semitism, famously said, and this is of course capable of application to any other context of uh, hatred. Um, he said that the, the Jew exists in the mind of the anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. If he did not exist, the anti-Semite would invent him. So hatred is more about the perpetrator's needs than the deeds of the victim. Um, the perpetrator, projects onto the victim whatever he needs the victim to be in order to deal with his own fears, his own cowardice, which is why at a more profound level of self-consciousness of what is it that makes us human, the human condition, the eternal question, what is it that makes us human? We begin to realize that inflicting harm on others is self-infliction of harm. That we are not just denying the humanity of the other, we're denying our own humanity uh, as well. And this is this thing called conscience. Conscience where we don't behave a certain way, not because we fear getting caught or embarrassed or whatever, but because we feel deep down inside that it is the right thing to do because we um, act out of self-respect. We act out of a relationship with our own self rather than fearing the judgment of others. And that's an incredibly important um, dimension to, to be aware of. Because whether it is, I don't know, a toxic uh, 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 relationship, it could be, I don't know, family relation, romantic relation, friendship, whatever the case may be, or 
a sort of toxic political discourse, you know, in a, in a more global scale. I think they're part of the same continuum. It's a kind of um, a moral, spiritual, emotional imbalance, uh, which then manifests itself um, in uh, toxic behavior. And so in a sense, genocidal violence is, is merely the extreme point on a spectrum which begins with um, our inability uh, to define ourselves um, in meaningful ways. And, I, and I, I say this because apathy and indifference is also a reflection of the same thing. Sometimes um, it's, it's easy to point a finger at someone who is acting out of hatred, but where does apathy fit into the equation? Um, one could even say that someone who acts out of hatred, perhaps acts out of ignorance, out of fear, out of cowardice, but they're alive. <laughs> there is a, there is some thing within them that they need to get out and they're expressing it in the worst possible way. And that same person who acts out of hatred can also act out of love and compassion. And that's the incredible thing that I've seen time and again, when people have that epiphany, when they realize how wrong what they've done is, and they decide to turn their life around. Mm -hmm. But apathy is a kind of death. Apathy means you don't feel anything, you're numb, you're indifferent. So while hatred and violence is absolutely wrong, and must be confronted, I think we also need to take very seriously uh, uh, apathy uh, mm -hmm. and how uh, it is also apathy that uh, enables uh, mm -hmm. all of these evil things uh, to happen in the world. Yeah, and, and, and I, if we can sort of push that a bit further, and because you, you've also outlined, um, I guess because of, um, on the one hand, our innate recognition of humanity and others, and and I guess also because of apathy that can exist as well. Um, how, in fact, um, genocidal hatred can be mounted? In fact, that it doesn't just exist. It's not something that um, uh, we, we all feel um, on, a, on a daily basis, but that it's actually um, a construction. It's actually planned, and that. There are, there are steps that seem to be um, necessary in order to reach, if you want, that sort of apex of, of hatred um, and violence in a population. And I was wondering if you could maybe remind us of some of those steps, maybe in Rwanda um, or other places that uh, might come to your mind where, um, in fact, before the genocide, there were there were very clear um, stages in preparing the population that was to be the perpetrators um, to be ready to commit these sorts of crimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I would begin by saying that there is a significant difference between impulsive hatred and instrumentalized hatred. Now, hatred is a human emotion we all feel at one point or another. It's intense dislike, disgust. Uh, uh, it's a sort of very powerful uh, emotion. And it's part of human nature to feel hatred from time to time. But there's a difference between that impulsive hatred and its systematic instrumentalization by political leaders. Because whether it's systemic racism, or genocide and all the sort of widespread injustices of the world, they require planning, they require resources. You can't just kill a million people in three months in a poor African country with very little infrastructure, which is what Rwanda was in 1994, uh, with a 70% uh, uh, illiteracy rate, 90% of people living in rural communities. And there was this uh, RTLM, Radio Television Libre des Mille Collines, 
which was absolutely instrumental to inciting the hatred, uh, giving this dose of poison every single day, which normalized the killing of Tutsis. And this is the scary thing about how injustices can become legitimized and normalized and it's a slippery slope it doesn't happen overnight people don't wake up overnight and commit these great acts of uh, injustice which is why culture is such an important arena of struggle and i'm a lawyer i'm a law professor i'm you know i should be exaggerating the importance of courtrooms and legislation and that has its place but our daily interactions in our families in our communities among our colleagues and peers, that is the root of profound revolutionary change. So cultural transformation. Uh, and in every case that I've seen, um, there has had to be a tremendous effort to create the powder keg so that then you can just throw a match and everything will, uh, you know, uh, become inflamed in this uh, inferno. And we saw some of this w in the United States with the um, insurrection uh, against the Capitol, the rise of um, white supremacy and the far right, uh, which is also a real problem in Canada. I think mm -hmm. we should not by any means be complacent. All it took was the right circumstances, the right ingredients for all of that ugliness and violence to come to the surface. So we're not immune. We're not immune from the same forces. But once again, getting back to your question about how it takes effort to condition people, um, which goes back to the discussion I had about how people don't instinctively want to kill their next door neighbor. <laughs> they need to be convinced. Um, I want to reflect on why it is perhaps that we've seen the rise of hateful populism in the Western liberal world in ways which were unimaginable. When I was writing the Massey Lectures, when I was writing my book in 2017, well, I was writing in 2016, um, Trumpism was unthinkable. Um, but by the time my book was published, I said, my goodness, all of these currents of hateful populism that I'd seen in Yugoslavia and Rwanda, halfway across the world, they can happen right here in our own backyard. So civilization is very uh, thin. So just as a sort of final thought on this point, it's easy to point the finger, obviously, at the racist, the misogynist, the extremists it's really easy we don't need to sit and have a big discussion that these things are not good but it's much more difficult to understand what are the conditions and circumstances which have let these forces come to the surface and we need to once again reckon with our culture of um, materialism uh, greed narcissism, the incredible social inequalities which have been created, but even more importantly, the tremendous alienation that we have in our culture. So when someone comes, and I've seen this in a conversation I had with a teenage suicide bomber that I met in a prison in northern Iraq, and it was incredible to see how, you know, he told me about, you know, he was with Islamic State, so-called. And I asked him, why were you going to go and kill all these innocent people? And he gave me his whole, you know, brainwashed ideology about, you know, it was for the sake of uh, uh, Islam and, and destroying the enemies of Islam. And it was a 16-year-old kid. He didn't have any idea what he's talking about. But when they were taking him back to his prison cell, I said goodbye to him. And he looked back at me and he says, I miss my mother. <laughs> I wanted to become a doctor. And I felt sorry for him. I mean, as much as he was extremely dangerous, I, I, I looked at this 16-year-old kid and I said, my God, what made 
His name was Ahmed. What made Ahmed the healer into Ahmed the killer? And I, I, I speak about this because when, when people are desperate, when people are alienated, and someone comes along and gives them an easy identity, makes them feel great and important, it works. Mm -hmm. Because he was a teenage boy who was a train wreck of shame, humiliation, desperation. And the corrosive forces that we have in our culture, which have created this psychic pandemic, this mental health crisis, are actually the perfect breeding grounds for extremist ideologies. So we shouldn't just point the finger at the neo-Nazis and the extremists and all of those people and feel virtuous, but we should also look at our uh, culture of greed and narcissism and hypocrisy and selfishness and ask, why is it that we have become so uh, alienated? And I just think about the famous statement of Eric Fromm in The Art of Loving, which he wrote in 1957, brilliant book, 1957, when consumerism was sort of really emerging. And he said that, you know, modern human beings are well-clad, well-fed, they're satisfied in every possible way, but they only experience the most superficial of connections with their fellow human beings. And I just imagine what would Eric Fromm write about the age of the internet and social media? It's interesting to me because you are an um, international uh, prosecutor. Um, you've, you've committed your life to the law, but in fact, our conversation has, has drifted towards the idea of culture as being um, a very important factor in preventing um, or conditioning, um, on the contrary, one or the other, um, the rise of populism and the rise of kind of hateful, hateful um, cultures. And it just makes me think then, from your point of view, on the other side, well, what is the role of law? And how can, when things get out of control or when things are planned um, to take a certain, a certain tack, um, what is the role of law in, in bringing uh, people to justice, bringing to, um, uh, indicting them, bringing them to trial, and and um, sentencing um, some of these perpetrators. I mean, um, it's clearly something you you, you value. And so, um, what are the hopes that you've had uh, for the role of law in acting as some kind of check uh, on these atrocities? The most important part of law is what sociologists, criminologists would call habitual lawfulness. Uh, when we prohibit murder in the criminal code of Canada, um, it's, in a, it's in a context where most Canadians uh, don't even think about solving their problems by murdering someone, not because of fear of criminal punishment, but because of socialization, because of the moral values that we've internalized. And that is exactly why mass crime is so challenging, because you have an inverted morality. Instead of habitual lawfulness, you have habitual criminality. In Rwanda, it was a good thing to kill the Tutsis. It wasn't a bad thing. People did not have pangs of conscience. They were celebrated as heroes expressing their solidarity with Hutu power and the extremists and what have you. So criminal justice in that context is not just about punishing this or that person, but about transforming values through the socio-pedagogical influence of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be in the streets of uh, Paris and London and cities in Europe that you had the spectacle of punishment people would be brought to a city square uh, and like a spectator sport, they would be subject to horrific torture, quartered by horses, boiled alive or what have you, to strike the fear of God in the citizenry so they wouldn't rise up against the king or the sovereign or what have you. And um, Michel Foucault writes about this in Discipline and Punish, 
uh, we have now shifted to the point where uh, we have this thing called the trial, the trial and courtroom drama. And it's the trial which um, beyond punishment for that individual uh, is a kind of uh, a flow of moral propaganda to instill subliminal inhibitions against wrongdoing uh, in the uh, conscience of the average person. So it's a kind of reification, reaffirmation of um, moral conceptions of, of, of right and wrong. So in that sense, both the content of the laws that we adopt and the way in which they're enforced um, have to be seen in this broader uh, sociological context, which brings me back to culture building. In a sense, we are uh, uh, either um, strengthening the pillars of existing values, or in certain cases, when we're redressing historical injustices, we are transforming the culture rather than uh, sort of strengthening the existing pillars, we're maybe putting in some new ones. And a classical example in Canada would be uh, racism and colonial injustice against indigenous peoples. Uh, look at the example of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, to me, that was a, a transformative moment in uh, Canada's sort of collective reckoning with this injustice, which was invisible. It was invisible. Unfortunately, it is still invisible, but far, far less so mm -hmm. after 6,000 residential school survivors came and they uh, told their stories. Um, so that's how I would look at the significance of um, law and legal process uh, in uh, reckoning with historical injustices. But I will just end on one note. Um, Hannah Arendt famously said after the Nuremberg judgment sentenced the Nazi leaders, she said that for these crimes, no punishment is enough. The Nazi crimes explode the limits of the law. And I mention it because um, we need to be careful not to place too much emphasis on institutions. Institutions as such only flourish when they are rooted in popular consciousness and support. And we saw it in the United States, the dismantling and corruption of the institutions of democracy. We realized how fragile they can be. All it takes is a violent mob and a whole country, the biggest superpower in the world, can be shaken to its core. And I'm amazed that things didn't turn out far, far worse in, in the capital. Mm -hmm. So I just want to end by saying that one of the reasons why, as the law professor and lawyer, I don't overemphasize courts and legislation and all of those things as important as they are is because very often when I speak to the wider public, as I did during the Massey lectures, people are oblivious to their own agency. They think, oh, wow, look at the professor doing all these impressive things out there as a prosecutor in The Hague. And, and they don't realize that what I do is no different than what anyone else does. Uh, and, and what we do on a daily basis, our daily transactions and relations are all part of making the world you know a, a better place and very often when people look to political leaders and elites to bring about change they disempower and disenfranchise themselves and i think it's very important for us to change the conversation so that we realize that the personal is the political mm -hmm. that these seemingly uh, irrelevant conversations and relations that we have every day are in fact the basis for the seismic shifts, uh, which are the, the lasting way of bringing about revolutionary change. We don't bring about revolutionary change by voting for this or that political party, as important as that may be, uh, but by changing uh, our culture from the grassroots. Thank you for that, Payan. Um, I'm keeping my eye um, on the time because there are a few questions here, so I'm gonna turn to those now. Um, and um, I'll start with the first one. Um, in the past few decades, an idea has emerged in Western economic and philosophical discourse, the idea of scientism. Um, the word endeavors to break 
down or break into the rationalized empirical hegemony of Western thought and make room for the emotional and interpretive discourse of the humanities. The word is also quite controversial, controversial and thinkers like Stephen Pinker call it a boo word. A what word? Boo. Okay. A boo word. Does, does scientism exist? Has it been exaggerated as a condition of knowledge? Well, that's a very, uh, very thoughtful uh, question and, and one cannot do justice to it in such a short span of time. But maybe if, if I could just give my very superficial uh, 30,000 feet uh, sort of historical overview, I, I think we need to realize that, you know, the European Enlightenment did not happen without reason. We, we, we need to look back at the days of uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the dark days of, you know, medieval um, uh, Christianity and, uh, and ignorance and disease and poverty. And just imagine, you know, today we're talking about the pandemic, which has uh, so caused so much distress. Well, the bubonic plague uh, in the 14th century wiped out half the population of Europe. And uh, uh, instead of understanding uh, you know, how this plague was spreading, people would go to the churches and pray to appease the angry gods. So, so science, uh, technology, learning, the enlightenment, intellectualization have in many respects been uh, uh, a profound source of good and progress. But, and here's where the but comes in, what we discovered through the Napoleonic Wars, through the First and Second World War, um, through uh, the evils of colonialism and modern ideologies, uh, communism, fascism, uh, and today under the shadow of catastrophic climate change, is that science and technology without a moral compass and without a profound spiritual sense of our place in the world can also be a source of self-destruction. And Arnold Toynbee famously said, civilizations are not murdered, they commit suicide. So for the first time in human history, we are on the brink of basically self-annihilation. And the, the wonderful thing about that is that we have no choice now but to um, reckon with some very fundamental verities about our way of life this is no longer you know, the Cold War where the issue is whether liberalism will prevail over communism or the question of nuclear proliferation and, and so on and so forth. We need to radically change our way of life, the way in which we define the pursuit of happiness even. And Max Weber famously said that modernity is about disenchantment, disenchantment with a universe of irrational religious beliefs and superstition. And one can understand why Max Weber would say such a thing, understandably. But I think we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. In, in the mad rush to progress, we have completely abandoned um, the spiritual, mystical dimension of human existence. But I think that we are now in a period of re-enchantment because of this alienation and emptiness which void is very often being filled with these ideologies, which goes back to what I said earlier about white supremacy, Islamic fundamentalism. One could say the same thing about uh, communism, uh, fascism. These were all substitute religions, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a kind of Western civilization emptied of Christianity, emptied of this sort of, you know, uh, deeper worldview. Uh, filled in the vacuum with all of these ideologies, which in a sense were far more catastrophic in their consequences than the Catholic Protestant wars of the 17th century. So I think that we are now in a remarkable period of history where postmodern society with unimaginable technological wonders, and we don't even understand how our society has been transformed by the information age, because we're still in the middle of it. Imagine 
The Industrial Revolution took 150 years, forever changed the course of human history. The technological platform which we are using to speak with each other now is barely 15 years old. So we don't understand or appreciate where we are now, how profoundly these technologies are going to transform the future. But the real challenge for us now is re-enchantment. How can we retrieve that spiritual, mystical self which will allow us to harness technology and science for greater good. And I will just end by saying one thing. I think the indigenous renaissance that we are witnessing today is quite remarkable because those same people that once upon a time we condemned, we meaning to say, you know, the, the so-called civilized world condemned as savages in need of being civilized and all of the colonial injustices and baggage that we're familiar with, they are now emerging as spiritual leaders because of their profound connection with nature, with creation. And I was reading the other day the words of uh, Chief uh, Metuktire, who's from a small tribe in the Brazilian Amazon, who in the most simple but profound words spoke about the burning of the Amazon rainforest. And he says, you're burning our home. And with that, you will destroy your home as well. I mean, how much more simple but true can it be? So in a sense, I think we are already in the process. And I would say in particular, the younger generations uh, are in the process of rejecting this consumerist, alienating, destructive, self-destructive uh, way of life. Uh, and uh, we need to make a much greater effort in retrieving this spiritual understanding where we realize that we are not at the center of the world, but in fact, we are an insignificant speck in an infinite universe, that our whole human race could vanish and the world will go on with or without us. And there's something liberating actually about understanding uh, our, our place in this greater galaxy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you make me think also about um, how, uh, you know, our, people's own personal faith can help inform um, their relationship with the world. And one of the questions speaks to your faith, the Baha'i faith, and um, it asks, um, how would you say if it's informed or influenced your, your political thinking? Well, I was born into a, a, a Baha'i family um, but um, uh, in, in my uh, faith, uh, the independent investigation of truth is actually a fundamental uh, responsibility, which is why I think that, uh, you know, um, we associate religion with dogmatism, with um, division, with a blind faith, uh, irrationality. Um, whereas for me, the independent investigation of truth is a form of knowledge. It's a form of knowledge. Spirituality is a form of knowledge. It's a way of understanding the world, actually. And other form, all other forms of knowledge, I think, must be informed by the spiritual understanding, technological, scientific, intellectual. Uh, whether we use those for good or for evil is a function of our spiritual self. But at the same time, I think that um, the Baha'i faith, which began in... 19th century Iran, and which faced severe persecution by religious fanaticism and those who uh, uh, wanted to sort of uh, avoid the revolutionary changes that it called for. It spoke about the equality of men and women, the harmony of science and religion, but most importantly, it spoke about um, how glorious uh, period of history we're living in because we're witnessing today the creation of a world civilization and if you go back in history you see all the prophets and poets and visionaries of the past spoke about world peace when all the peoples of the world would come together well how exciting that we're actually experiencing that, that, that today it's messy don't get me wrong these aren't the days of Marshall McLuhan, 1960s, where the global village was this very romantic idea. Uh, today, we realize globalization is messy. It's also about mass migration and organized crime and 
environmental destruction and a whole lot of other things. But as a Baha'i, I was brought up basically with the idea that the unification of all peoples in one world civilization is inevitable. It's inevitable. The only question is, will we achieve it through vision and volition in solidarity with each other? Or will we achieve it because of some catastrophe which leaves us with no choice? So this vision of a world civilization based on the spiritual reality of humankind certainly has profoundly shaped my own uh, understanding of the world around me and also of the choices that I've tried to make in, in my own life. Continue with that, and we only have a couple of minutes left, unfortunately. But I'd like to ask you, uh, during the last year, we all know we've all been witness to the profound changes um, in the world. And I wonder if uh, this year of crises has in any way um, altered or, or shaped your outlook um, in, in, in any way differently than um, than, than you had before this year? Uh, most certainly, I think like uh, everyone else, my life has been uh, touched and shaped and upended by the pandemic. But at the same time, when I detach myself from my own sort of grievances about, oh, I wish I could just go on with my life as it was, and I wish I could travel and see my parents and, and, and what have you, I also think that there is, this is one of those moments where you kind of think that the universe is speaking to us. <laughs> the universe is telling us to slow down, to consume less, to think more about life, to be more gentle and compassionate and caring, um, and to realize how fragile human life is. I think in our technologic world of technological wonders, we have these delusions of grandeur and invincibility. And then we realize that, yes, the sky may be the limit in terms of you know, technological wonders and all that, but a microscopic creature can destroy and upend all of civilization. And we have to realize that this pandemic is really very mild, very mild. The death rate uh, of COVID-19 is infinitesimally smaller than let's say Ebola, which had an 80% mortality rate. And who is to say that there isn't a much worse pandemic around the corner? And I'm not saying this to be alarmist, but it shows us that the inextricable interdependence of humankind isn't some you know, naive ideal or some far-fetched fantasy. It's, it's an inescapable reality. We're either going to all of humankind is going to swim or sink together. <laughs> so what happens halfway across the world in Wuhan or, or what have you uh, is in an instant going to affect the rest of the world. And one could say that about practically everything else, everything else that shapes our lives today. So as I said, during my student days, you know, the global village was still some very uh, progressive idea. And today it's, it's a reality. The problem is that our political systems and leaders and patterns of thought and even our cultural identities still have not grasped that we need an all-embracing vision of humanity, not just because it's morally desirable, but because it's the only way in which we're going to survive. And I am confident that we will come out of this pandemic wiser and better people. Um, and I, at the same time, think that there will be yet other things around the corner, um, which the universe will send our way <laughs> to, to teach us uh, how to live a, a better, uh, more meaningful uh, and compassionate lives. Thank you very much, Payam Akavan. As, as it was last time, it has been an instructive and hopeful, profound uh, conversation with you. And on behalf of the Humanities Department and the Vanier community, um, I thank you for spending time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best.
thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks to our participants for joining us and um, have a very good day.